Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank Rony and Magda uh, for your acts of care and for holding a space in which we can think, learn and make together, which is exactly what we're going to do this morning. And it's what we've been doing this past week. Um, this morning we gather here by the power of, um, <laughs> you, can, you can't hear me, can you hear me? Okay. We gather here moved by the power of refusal and dissidence. I told you I was going to do this. Uh, yesterday during Dudu's performance, Yesterday during Dudu's generous offering, I was reminded of a 1970 short film by Ghanaian filmmaker Ni Kwate Owa, You Hide Me, which is the first clip that we saw. And I thought that we should activate this morning's discussion with that, You Hide Me. Also, from the same year, 1970, I thought to juxtapose um, Apunti per un di Africana by Italian filmmaker Pierpaolo Pasolini. And then from 62, so you know, eight years before 1970, um, Le Kiss by Michelangelo Antonioni. I thought there was an interesting conversation happening there. So I really wanted to start there. Um, a little preview on what to expect this morning. Um, when I had the invitation to do this today, I had a completely different idea on what to offer. And I pretty much scrapped the paper that I wrote <laughs> and decided to do something else because I thought it was important. And um, this morning I will be reading musings on restitution mass um, inspired by Dudu and gatekeepers. And uh, as Magda said earlier, this is not just me reading the paper, because honestly, <laughs> I'm big, I'm, you can just you know, read it by yourself. But I really want us to think about this keyword that if you are taking notes or if you're taking mental notes, I want us to keep remembering as I read. Restitution, appearance, masking, theater, to gay kick. In my research, um, I play a lot with language. Uh, if you know me in day to day, you know that I normally don't just speak one language. I, there is this Italianish that I keep promoting, which is sort of creolizing the Italian language. And um, but specifically, just so you follow this reading, I talk a lot about another land and other land. And I want you to sort of activate your imagination as I, as I read. Among the offenses related to the field of cultural heritage, the looting of ancestral vessels is certainly the most deplorable. In other land, like elsewhere, looting of artifacts not only ravages worked objects, but also deprives local community of their centers. Center is another word I want you to think about. Nonetheless, due to the art market exponential demand for antiquities and a development of the commercial market, it is also the most profitable. Profit is another word I like us to think about. Indeed, ethnographic worked objects from other land were first collected during the 19th and early 20th century as part of another land's colonial agenda. However, it was not until the 1920s and 1930s that they became art and thus awarded a prize. Although museums in Konyoju land 
both centuries of expertise as cultural gatekeepers, they often fail in doing their due diligence as somehow they manage to acquire illicit artifacts, somehow. Coincidentally, their acquisitions are almost always protected by what it feels to be an infinite number of conceptions, ultimately legitimizing their possession. I believe that if other lands worked objects are not fully comprehended, how can the damage caused by its illicit removal be properly assessed and dismissed? To support us today, um, it could be interesting to subdivide the faces of looting and consequently analyze legislations, but it's too early in the morning. And how this works, and how this works in relation to museums. I like us to think what it means to hold and care. Moreover, I argue that in substitution to illicit antiquities, museums should possess moral awareness and empathy and consider the consequences of the systematic plundering that happen in many other lands countries. Plundering is another word I'd like us to think about. Of course, museums should not be the only ones to be singled out, hey, shared responsibility, and give accountability. However, by displaying stolen artworks by default, they become participants and collaborators of other lands cultural theft. Prior to narrowing my argument down to specific case studies, I think that it's foremost necessary to understand the context in which contemporary looting happens. Archaeological looting thrives in three stages. The first phase consists of the retrieval of objects. The second involves the movement to a safe space. We love that word, don't we? And finally is the sale. So retrieval, containing a safe place, sale. Sometimes as some archeological sites are located in the close proximity of villages and or isolated and not subject to the competent authorities checks, Searches are executed during the day, perhaps with the involvement of the local population. Once an artifact is discovered, it is stored in safe havens, the joy, by those who want to manage the sale without intermediaries or are delivered directly to the merchants. The sale of the objects can be led by local leaders who share the proceeds among all the inhabitants, but also by art dealers who in some cases in some cases provide for the monetary maintenance to the villages. We have to keep up this ecosystem of sharing. Sharing is another word I really want us to mull over. What does it mean to share? The sale of the objects can be led by local lead. Oh no, I've read that already. <laughs> this questionable partnership lasts as long as there is a need to deliver an appropriate amount of cultural goods. Moreover, it is also possible that the artifacts to be entered in the antiquity black market are actually stolen directly from museum exhibitions. It has happened. Sadly, there are networks of antiquity dealers, galleries, and small museums belonging or directly linked to this crime. Yet, the growing interest in Cornel Jewland towards African cultural heritage has encouraged smugglers to single-handedly deal with the transport of the lesser quality products destined abroad. 
the export of cultural goods can take place by air, sea, or by land. In the first two instances, art traffickers normally would have false export permits, whereas in the third case, the movement of materials happens across some other land nations by car. Movement is another word I love, us, love for us to think about how things move and are stored and held. Most of the international markets by networks linked to collectors are auction houses or museums. Consequently, through the obvious illegal aspect of the trade and awareness of what happens behind the scenes, which is what I'm setting up today, this morning, there should be no discussion of whether museums should display looted artifacts. However, critical and condemning one might be in regards to looted other land artifacts, sometimes it may happen that museums acquire works of art of illegal origin as a result of recklessness. This has happened. In 1999, I can offer that actually. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in 1999, this recklessness was quite public and it involved the acquisition of some sculptures. Thankfully, a few months after the purchase, the managers of the museums admitted the mistake and obtained authorization from other lands government to exhibit the sculptures in their own institution in Kunyoju land for a period of 25 years. Regardless, my stance against the display of looted artifacts still stands, and I believe that to an extent, I, a useful approach in preventing international trafficking of artifacts is perhaps um, stipulated by Decree Number 77 of 1979 which allows uh, other lands police uh, and customs officers to search without warrant anyone suspected of buying or selling antiquities without authorization which must always be made to the commission and ratified by other lands of the i actually don't want to say the name of 1970 Another word I want us to really think about is what it means to allow, allowing, to hold, to permit, authorization. The latter largely due to the significant number of member countries signed up to the organization I did name, is the main international instrument in the fight against illicit trafficking of artifacts. Despite the many shortcomings in its text, that convention in 1970, in fact, is a diplomatic tool which scope is, to restrict, which scope is restricted to artifacts from museums and that grants to each state the discretion to independently decide on the basis of compatibility with their own legal system, which measures of the treaties should adopt. So it's almost like a pick and mix, you know, at the when you're choosing candy. In addition, that convention of 1970 does not provide useful procedures to ensure the return of artifacts to their homeland and does not contain obligations or sanctions against so-called transit states that even being neutral serve as the link between the country of origin and final destination of cultural property. What does it mean? What does cultural property mean? In recent years, both uh, the central government of the Netherlands and the international community of Kunyonju land have initiated a number of programs to address the problem of looting. As we know, language shapes ships as well, and we give meaning to language. So what does looting mean? Furthermore, it is worth to mention the various initiatives promoted by several councils of museums to raise awareness on the issues related to the, the spoliation of other lands 
cultural heritage. We start from the dissemination of news related to the theft of stolen goods. We, we see the headlines. To the drafting of an inventory. And finally, to the publication of um, whatever um, study comes out of it. The latter consists of a list of the main categories of exposed archaeological heritage at risk of theft. So what, what happens, what's been happening is awareness and little action. However, these initiatives have proved to be ineffective in the long run. And when I talk about the long run, I talk about the present moment. As the looting of artifacts happens to be a well-established phenomenon. I can't say that word. Phenomenon. phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> Rooted in national consciousness. Again, consciousness and underestimated on an investigative level. By exploring and giving context as to what the looting of another land and artifacts entail, I always argue against the display of stolen objects in museum based on common ineligibility grounds. However, these grounds are often petulantly challenged by museums wanting to proceed with the exhibition of illicit and decontextualized objects. Actually, this is an example that I love to name. So we're not in fantasy land, we're actually in reality now. A prime example of this would be the Africa, the art of the continent, exhibited in 1995 also the year I was born, at the Royal Academy of Arts in London, which by wanting to display the looted artifact generated a number of debates as to whether or not they should. Very Shakespearean to be or not to be. In their words, they should be allowed to display looted artifacts to the public because, I quote, while the illicit trade in items of cultural property from archaeological sites in Africa and elsewhere must be eradicated, the cause of promoting awareness of both the, man, the, the damage that this trade is causing to the patrimony of these states concerned and the importance of these works cannot be served by hiding them from an interested and possibly influential international audience. This process of publication allied, as is our intention, with an extensive educational program must accompany the implement implementation of national as well as international legislation for the profile and effectiveness of such measures to be maximized. This is a quote, I don't know if it makes sense, but it doesn't. <laughs> I quoted this issue quite extensively. Um, this issue that was released by the Royal Academy because no paraphrasing would have fairly depicted the extent of how museums through various conceptualizations will defend the possessions of looted artifacts even when they know it's wrong. It's just wrong. The British Museum, a legitimate custodian of hundreds of bronzes, looted from other land during the 1897 punitive expedition. Punitive being rooted from punishment. Has adopted a similar rhetoric to the Royal Academy. This is the pompous conviction that looted artifacts from other land should be displayed and kept in foreign countries as to attract an influential international audience. An audience that has better opportunity of viewing displaced, displaced worked objects in European cities like Milan, London, Paris, or Berlin rather than in Lagos, 
Bakar, Cape Town, and Accra. Furthermore, museums defend the tenure of looted African artifacts by constantly referring to concept conceptualizations such as shared heritage or the universal museum. And these are actual names. Um, it's now other land or another land or Kunio land. These imperialistic concepts urge critics to recognize that objects acquired in earlier times must be viewed in the light of different sensitivities, oh my God, <laughs> sensitivities and values reflective of that earlier era. Uh, this is a quote from the Universal Museum. And therefore, one should not blame them for displaying artifacts that are, his, that are historically known to be looted. It is, a, it is an accusation that belongs in the past. So, accountability, looted, belonging, past. However, can concepts such as the Universal Museum be used to brush looted or commissioned work to objects under the rug, most especially when they have well-documented evidence showing how violence is adopted when acquiring antiquities. I actually want to say that again. Can concepts such as the Universal Museum be used to brush looted or commissioned worked objects under the rug, most especially when they have well-documented evidence showing how violence is adopt adapted when acquiring antiquities. Moreover, how can museums in Kunyoju land justify displaying looted artifacts by parading the fact that other land scholars and experts also have the opportunity to contribute intellect, thus shared heritage. Thank you. It is obvious that museums such as and do not truly believe in their own thoughts, as works of art by Konyo Juland masters should be on the grand tour of other land museums by now. Also, as Afo mentioned, there is the question of multitude perspectives in regards to interpreting other land artifacts. Will discussions that argue against the display of looted art be truly be taken into consideration. Or for example, a, con a contrasting observation that declares that other land artifacts will serve the newly contextualized purpose by per perhaps being returned to their countries of origin. Would that be taken on board as a countercultural supremacy proposition? I'm actually about to conclude. Given the very simple and straightforward fact that illicit looting is a crime, I still argue that other land artifacts, whether from 1897 or 2023, should not be displayed, most especially outside of the country. In addition, as long as looted artifacts remain outside of the domain. At the very least, genuine intellectual power should be shared with the people belonging to the country when interpreting worked objects. I repeat that. In addition, as long as looted artifacts remain outside of the domain, at the very least, genuine intellectual power should be shared with the people belonging to the country when interpreting worked objects. By taking this approach, Kunio Jude Land Museums could shy away from the criticism 
that in addition to possessing looted or commissioned artifacts, and sometimes explain it, they are also culprits of cultural centrality. I end. of what the word share, the verb sharing invokes in their spirit. Anyone, whoever wants to start. We can also take a moment to pause as well, because I know that was a lot. <laughs> Parlerò in italiano perché è complesso. Allora, non ho una risposta perché non lavoro in questo ambito, però eh, patrimonio condiviso in termini di eh, opere eh, che sono state eh, esportate dai territori d'origine e da signore te che, non lo so, l'impressione del patrimonio condiviso mi sembra che nonostante sia condiviso nella concretezza perché eh, l'Europa ha basato anche il mostrare la propria ricchezza su quel patrimonio condiviso, però c'è un rapporto di forza mh, ineguale, cioè e per quanto mi riguarda sia che eh, quelle opere oggetti di culto e tutti quegli strumenti Um, siano stati um, ottenuti da parte di Stati europei, uh, ma sia tramite processi politici di colonizzazione, sia uh, tramite dei, proce dei processi economici più privati, perché uh, rimane il rapporto di forza diseguale e per me che sono uh, italo-nigeriana e che non, è difficilissimo in Italia eh, ritrovare una storia particolare della cultura Ibo eh, perché eh, viene descritta soltanto come appunto ok, questo è il luogo, quando, ma appunto co come può essere condiviso se le persone che vogliono ricorrere a quella storia non ne hanno degli strumenti accessibili e invece a livello di um, appunto um, proprio possedimento di oggetti di cultura um, cioè, no, non solo sono stati presi ma non sono accessibili nel, um, nell'averci a che fare con una simbologia quindi per me patrimonio condiviso lo è soltanto perché la, la colonizzazione europea riguarda anche eh, le persone afrodiscendenti e gli Stati europei. Però c'è un rapporto di forza um, che appunto non rende la condivisione paritaria. Come, come 
Hello? Oh, Se torniamo al basic, ah, grazie mille, ho sufficiente. E we are all sort of learning words, right? The exercise I would love for us to do is sort of think about the power and meaning and how we shape shift words, right? And how we give meaning to words. So, in questo preciso momento, quando se ti dico condividere, how would you define it? Condividere, per come la uso io, scusa, scrivo, no, no, vai. <laughs> non so perché ho sentito la traduzione. Comunque, per me condivisione ha un rapporto più paritario rispetto a quello che è il, lo stato del delle opere rubate ai vari contenuti non arpeggi okay. commissionate condivisione cioè c'è un punto con etimologicamente quindi insieme ehm, cioè dividere c'è cioè, ok non so tu non ci puoi da cosa devi dividere ma non lo so appunto non mi, non mi suona come, come parola come Dunque parità è eh, al senso. Per me una condivisione è in un rapporto uh, più equo, perché se no non può, cioè è, è condiviso teoricamente, ma non nella pratica, perché ad esempio io, persona italiana nigeriana, non ho lo stesso, um, la stessa opportunità di accedere a quella conoscenza, mm. perché è stata rubata sia dal mio territorio di origine, sia in Italia, non viene raccontata nella sua complessità. Period. Grazie. Anche io parlerò in italiano, scusa. No? Eh, grazie. Ehm... Io mi ricollego molto al discorso di Gaia, Gaia giusto? E, io credo che nel senso è, cioè bisogna fare un, un passo precedente, cioè se la domanda che si pone alle istituzioni museali eh, o in generale ai luoghi della parola, ai luoghi del potere in cui credo di poter inserire anche il museo è appunto eh, che cosa significa condividere e quindi eh, utilizzare la dicitura patrimonio culturale condiviso, cioè questa domanda secondo me eh, innesca un boomerang al contrario di domande necessarie per costruire questa domanda, mi spiego. E prima di porsi questa domanda secondo me, si do, cioè, dal mio punto di vista si dovrebbe riflettere su quali categorie il museo utilizza per definirsi, ripetilo, quali categorie utilizza il museo per definirsi che sono categorie che anche tu che hanno attraversato il tuo discorso cioè possesso, accentramento esposizione, conservazione mh, di nuovo proprietà e queste categorie che definiscono e profilano l'istituzione museale sono in netto contrasto con le possibilità della parola condivisione che è stare insieme, che rapporto paritario orizzontale, che empatia, che ascolto, che dialogo, che risocializzare il proprio privilegio. Sono due, sono due dimensioni che ad ora non credo possano eh, intrecciarsi, perché credo sia preliminare eh, uno sforzo di ripensamento e di risignificazione delle categorie che definiscono cos'è il museo, a partire con l'inizia Qualche, qualche minuto fa, eh, non lo so, il, la definizione ufficiale eh, dichiarata dall'ICOM, no? che si sta un po' ridisegnando a livello teorico che cos'è il museo, che cos'è la museologia, la museografia, si stanno facendo delle transizioni teoriche, dobbiamo passare per quei percorsi, secondo me, prima di arrivare a a porci una domanda tanto audace come che cosa significa condivisione e cosa significa patrimonio culturale condiviso. Sono un po' più perplessa. Grazie, <laughs> grazie mille. Everybody speak it. <laughs> Hello, thank you for your sharing. Uh, when you. you ask, uh, it's very interesting to uh, think about the, uh, 
the meanings of the words. And uh, when I think about uh, sharing, I think about involvement. Okay. Uh, because uh, if people are involved, uh, they can share, they can participate, and they can narrate their, their own history. Uh, sometimes I uh, um, can sell the histories. Uh, and so if you involve people in uh, museums or uh, in, uh, in uh, narrate their heritage, is the only way to share it. Because um, I have said that it's a uh, uh, paritario, I don't know in English, this uh, equal, equal, <laughs> thank you, equal uh, relationship is the basis of sharing, uh, in my opinion. And uh, I can make an example. Um, I'm studying uh, social museology. <laughs> Uh, so uh, Damn. <laughs> we we talk about this uh, every day uh, in this one. Uh, it's the Lusophone University. It's a PhD about uh, the social role of the museum. So the new museology has been many years from uh, 1970 that is talk about the role of museums and one of uh, Many example of our professor, uh, which are many of Brazil, that they had a, a huge uh, colony history, uh, is about uh, uh, the National Museum of Rio de Janeiro, uh, where uh, uh, one of my professors is the curator of the museum, and uh, local religious leaders offered to the museum um, stolen uh, religious artifacts about Santeria, local religions that were pro prohibited then in Brazil in the past. So uh, people, um, activists, uh, recuperate, uh, recuperate their heritage and they offer to the museum. So what uh, he did, he invited the uh, religious leader to uh, work with the director. He said, I, I, I'm useful here. <laughs> you are the protagonist. And so they did a ceremony. For them, it was very important to, to be the protagonist. So this is just one example. So it's the approach of the museum, of the institution. They can have another approach if they want. <laughs> Thank you. I actually love the fact that you use the word um, protagonist, because one of the words I wanted us to reflect on was theatre and theatrics as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I'm yeah reflecting on uh, the word sharing, sharing. It seems to me that sharing is such a like soft word which has been robbed of like any political meaning in the same way that like community has also been and i think also like uh um diversity it's like all these words that you can use to not actually make any political statement um i don't i don't remember where i read this might have been in the under comments not sure but it was basically like is community all that we're asking for? Like, is that really the only thing that we want? Um, is it? <laughs> question mark. And so it's like, yeah, sharing is important. Community is important. Diversity is important. But like, that shouldn't be the only thing that we get or something. It's like, that's almost like a vehicle to someplace. So it's like, where are we going? What do we want when we get there? And it also sucks that these words that like mean a lot to us, mean a lot to me, have been robbed of their meaning. It almost makes me feel like I have to be much more political in my language because by saying I want community with someone, um, they won't give me what I want, you know? Um, they won't give me the tools to be able to build a community. Um, so it's like those words just don't mean anything anymore. I can't use them. Build and sustain. Thank you. Um, I also have to reflect on sharing a little bit, and part of this comes from 
my very, very elementary knowledge of Italian, but it's just fascinating to hear people share on, what is it, uh, condividere, um, which, you know, it's, it's kind of like dividing together, right, if we're thinking about it in terms of English. So, so then if we're thinking about sharing in terms of already dividing together, then the question becomes to get the slice of the pie, right? We are already playing this game of racial capitalism as individualized, minoritized subjects when there is the much more urgent demand for collective action, right? So I think, you know, musing on continuity, uh, I suppose it's just how can we think about sharing in terms of not something that's not an individualized possession, right? That's not the mathematical operation of scarcity of, you know, everyone gets a smaller slice, then we will share it. But how do we think about in how do we think about it? Not in the language of possession, but how do we all get what we want in this multiplication that is really operating on more sort of economy of abundance, um, but with political purpose, right? Yeah. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> that is a beautiful line of questioning. And also thank you because I wrote that as an asterisk, the the word called dividere. And then you break it down was so beautiful and so on point. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, and for the questioning of words, I think it's something that's really important because um, one of the things we know is that words take on different meaning according to which context they are in. So the word community can actually have the meaning we want it to have in a certain circumstance. But it's not universally so, you know. Um, but I think that um, so also sharing it can mean, you know, some really beautiful things. But in the context of um, looted objects, that word means something completely different. Um, it talks about positions of power. But I think that in terms of, um, for me, thinking about sharing in in relation to stolen objects. Um, it makes me think a lot about how how much sharing then becomes on property. It becomes about really anchored in this idea of ownership, right? And for me, when we think about these objects and other things as parts of heritage, and not just objects, um, what does it mean to think of heritage as property? And then what does ownership look like if you start thinking of it that way, right? Um, because I think that's a lot of times, um, when there's ways in which words can sort of take something that is this really um, huge, immense, and powerful thing and reduce it to materiality, right? So reduce it to the materiality of those objects. And in doing so, remove all of the technologies that Dulu talked about yesterday that were involved in developing them, all of the sort of spiritual layers that are embedded in them, and everything that is not recognized when you look at them as objects, when you look at them as material. Um, and, and so the idea of property becomes something that I think is particularly problematic uh, in this relation because it, it leaves behind so many things that are actually the real reasons why these things are important. I think that's all I wrote. Thank you so much. English or Italian? No, I don't. Okay, Italian. Io ho, ho ascoltato molti e sono venuti molti, molte parole eh, parlando di, dell'oggetto in questione, utilizzo anche questo, questa, questa parola. Ma questi oggetti, noi ci siamo chiesti mai cosa sono, cosa, cosa hanno rappresentato. Al di là del, perché hai detto all'inizio una cosa molto importante, il, il mercato commerciale. E vorrei ricordare che questi oggetti di cui noi stiamo parlando, nessuno di questi è nato come oggetto d'arte. Repeat that again, please. Pardon? Say that again, please. Ripeti quella frase, per favore. Questi oggetti di cui stiamo parlando, nessuno è nato come uh, arte. Perché l'arte la, africana non esiste, non sono nati, non sono nati come 
è un nome che è stato dato a degli oggetti cul cultuali perché ogni statua, ogni maschera nasce per svolgere un ruolo, una funzione religiosa all'interno delle comunità. E mai abbiamo pensato di dipingere quadri per onorare lo spirito degli antenati o fare un totem. Erano dei luoghi di celebrazione di un culto, luoghi rituali. Ma questi oggetti, visti dall'esterno, perché la forma di espressione artistica in Occidente esisteva, quando sono arrivati questi oggetti hanno... Uh, hanno uh, risvegliato dei desideri di pensarlo di la diversità la, 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 la costruzione di questi oggetti con potrei dire anche una tecnologia primitiva uh, nella grafica nel, nel come sono realizzati e qualcuno l'ha pensato come un soprammobile, un oggetto da avere nel salotto, un oggetto da esporre sul piedestallo, perché la maschera o la statua sul piedestallo, fuori dal suo contesto, non ha più la sua ragione di esistere, perché non, non può essere un oggetto statico, ma un oggetto in movimento durante l'evoluzione religiosa, perché partecipa all'evento. E quindi um, io vorrei uh, puntare, soffermarmi a riflettere su, al di là della valenza commerciale di questi oggetti, perché dal momento in cui qualcuno li ha dati il nome di oggetto d'arte, sono visti molte volte sotto questo aspetto. Ma io vorrei spostare lo sguardo, la riflessione a cosa significa per quelle persone che li hanno utilizzati, che li hanno costruiti, perché questi oggetti devono stare in posti precisi, non possono stare ovunque, perché sono portatori di, di energie che hanno accumulato nel corso dei secoli, nel corso degli anni e durante tutte le funzioni sono oggetti anche a volte un po' pericolosi a tenerli in casa, perché yeah. non sai cosa hai dentro a casa. Volevo solo Grazie, condividere metto. questo, <ride> perché la condivisione è anche una parola che può avere molti significati a seconda delle persone. Io sono legatore museale e lavoro su opere eh, d'arte europee in chiave interculturale restituendo la, il racconto aggiungendo un elemento nuovo valorizzando questo, questa opera d'arte non, eh, non utilizzo l'arte di un altro continente per sminuirlo o per, per farci soldi la voglio valorizzare per quello che rappresenta per la comunità e vorrei anche che cominciassimo a pensare alle opere che si trovano qui in un altro modo e, e dargli il loro senso, la, 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 la loro valenza, non solo economica, ma anche emotiva e culturale. Thank you so much. Actually, I know Romy wants to speak as well, um, but I just really quickly, I just wanted to, in fact, the, thank you so much for you. Um, after your performance and sort of the in conversation that you had yesterday, it's what inspired today's uh, motion. I was going to talk about film <laughs> and archives and the Black Power movement, you know, and but here we are in this space. And actually, you made a very important question, which was how does it feel to be in this space confronted by these spirits? And quite honestly, I felt so uncomfortable <laughs> on Tuesday. Almost what I feel going to a madhouse will feel, which is total empathy. 
but then also the disturbance and the inadequacy of these spirits just roaming in case disturbed, not at peace. Um, so I thought, hey, let's rethink about what words and the meaning of words and act on them. And maybe after this morning, we can collectively create some sort of toolkit, which again is also laboring for oppression, but it's okay. <laughs> we can do it together. We actually are allowing this. Thank you, Romy. Yeah, I, I, I love that you are asking us to consider very carefully words, and this has already come up in our session. I think Stefano Harney listed a set of words also that we should consider very carefully, refusal, et cetera. So I think this is very much in alignment with that, and I really appreciate it. And if we consider the word share, you know, I think to consider the verb form of this is really important um, to share. And I say this because right now the news uh, in the U.S. and in most newspapers is that most of the cities are having trouble accepting uh, migrants uh, into the cities which are coming in, in, in droves. And the problem around that is most basically the problem of sharing resources, really basic things, sharing hotel rooms, sharing a place to live, sharing food, um, sharing clothes. This is a, a basic foundational problem. So it makes me, me, and I think about the very primal moment of sharing, which most of us, I think, have experienced probably at two years old, between two and five, where our parents or somebody that stewards us through life asks us to share our bread or to share our water or to share our crayon or to share our, you know, smile. And so, you know, it makes me think that sharing is something that we have to, to learn and practice. And so the language of shared heritage is mostly problematic because it assumes that we're not practicing the production and the making of shared heritage. So you can't have a shared heritage, you have to make a shared heritage. As those people in New York City who don't want to let migrants in can make a shared heritage with the new people that are coming to the city or that we can create a shared heritage by sharing food with each other or sharing water. So I think these constant acts and, and practice around sharing, giving, generosity, it's why I wanted to highlight what happened at the end of our session yesterday with something like, like, like uh, Professor Page's practice. You have to be in the practice of sharing to really put that on the table as something that you're doing. So a museum could not tell us that this is a shared heritage but actually uh, help us learn how to share. Thank you so much. Thank you. But in Italian. No, no, certo. OK. Già funziona. Sono d'accordo con Romy, però io penso che per dare le condizioni di condividere c'è bisogno di capire che situazione c'è. E come è successo <ride> che c'è qualcosa no, che deve essere eh, ricondiviso. Perché la storia è già una storia comune, solamente che in questa storia comune ci sono dei, dei livelli di potere che si traducono. No. Allora, io penso ai musei, musei antropologici, musei etnografici, nascono con, questo, con questa doppia attitudine. Da un lato devono costituire l'identità dello Stato-Nazione e del cittadino, no, e quindi stanno facendo un lavoro. E dall'altro lato, no, a seconda della filosofia del momento, probabilmente ci sanno, vogliono mostrare come le persone bianche civilizzate erano all'alba dei tempi, no? secondo una prospettiva eh, razzista, antropologica. E allora, per me è importante chiedervi, questo museo, non, 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 il museo che nasce con questo intento, può essere eh, riformato o va svuotato, no? e non solo svuotato degli oggetti, ma proprio svuotato nel senso di, cioè, perché lo spazio, no? come lo crei, <ride> quando lo spazio è già riempito, io mh, faccio fatica a immaginarmi eh, cioè, la ridistribuzione di potere e risorse senza no, un'epurazione un rituale materiale, 
di, di quegli spazi. Wow, gra grazie mille. Also, just really quickly, because before, because my memory is not set up like that. <laughs> um, thank you so much for that line of questioning. Che actually, um, dopo che abbiamo finito, o in the, we're in the middle of thinking about this word, just what also you said to empty. And then you said, um, how do you make space when the cup, the vessel, is already full? I love that. Thank you. Gaia? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank sul posizionamento, cioè secondo me non eh, volevo collegare al discorso di Romi eh, perché condivido appieno, eh, sento che in Europa, non so se anche in America, manca da parte delle istituzioni eh, culturali, istituzioni, una consapevolezza storica, come ha risottolineato Magda, di, queste, eh, di questi dislivelli di, 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 di rapporti di potere che se vogliamo mh, pensare a delle strategie toolkit utili, cioè io, io mi pongo la questione mh, oltre se è ancora mh, utile pieno il museo, però a questa cosa non, non so rispondere se non mh, che sia cioè, se non le costruzioni necessarie, poi vabbè. C'è un discorso di mancanza di spazi, quindi faccio fatica a rinunciare ad uno spazio, cioè vorrei che venisse messo a disposizione, cioè distribuito alle comunità. Eh, non so se ci sono le condizioni, però no, niente, mi chiedo se le istituzioni siano in grado di fare conti con il proprio posizionamento. Cioè questa è una cosa che mi interessa e forse chiedo proprio a chi sta lavorando eh, in questi contesti, se è uscito come, come tema da parte del, cioè, e prendo voi perché siete qui, um, però c'è una ricerca del in che posizione siamo? Per forza, per forza ci deve essere e forse anche se siamo qui ora è proprio anche per questo, no? E infatti noi siamo qui soprattutto per ascoltare in primis, però anche per come dire, metabolizzare le cose che, che stanno emergendo adesso e pensare anche come è possibile fare poi un passo in avanti che sia proattivo. Eh, Romy ha parlato tanto di micro strategie no? ed, è, ed è ovvio, voglio dire, dobbiamo anche essere tutti concreti, realistici. È chiaro che eh, il museo nasce capito, come istituzione imperiale e imperialistica, poi ha una fase con la rivoluzione francese di come dire, condivisione, diventa un museo pubblico, però al tempo stesso è ovvio che il museo come dire, nasconde per mostrare, quindi già di per sé è un luogo paradossale. Noi poi, nella specificità di questa tipologia di museo, rappresentiamo ulteriormente no? un paradosso ed una complessità. Ancora di più forse noi qui all'interno del MUDEC da un certo punto di vista, perché pur essendo un museo che dovrebbe, in teoria, nella versione soft e positiva, rappresentare le culture del mondo, in pratica è l'unico museo civico che non è gestito davvero dalla città o completamente dalla città, ma è in parte come dire, gestito da un partner privato. No? E quindi figuratevi se noi non viviamo questo tipo di complessità e di, e di contraddizione all'interno. Però credo che se vogliamo tutti uh, arrivare ad un punto che possa portare a qualcosa, dobbiamo come dire, positivamente cercare di fare un vuoto uh, come dire, metaforico e quindi veramente creare e dare spazio e pensare in che modo possiamo avere uno spazio di dialogo. Io vabbè, avrei voluto dirlo dopo, non voglio occupare troppo spazio perché ci eravamo detti che parlavamo di questo alle tre, alle due e mezza, alle due e mezza. Uh, per cui mi taglio qui e ne riparliamo dopo, se no occupo troppo spazio. Delle strategie, magari parliamo di dopo. Of course, Simone, I feel like you want to say something. My first victim. No. 
Mi ha fatto partire una riflessione sul anche l'accordo, cioè fare voto metaforico o effettivamente fare un voto concreto, perché cioè, io in questo non, non ho una posizione chiara, però sento tuttora i rapporti di forza presenti anche nella città di Milano e come ci sono rapporti di forza presenti a livello economico culturale. Eh, tanto che un museo è costretto a tantissimi spazi per eh, continuare a provare a fare cultura, essere finanziato da enti privati. Cioè, la cosa che mi fa riavvicinare al ragionamento di Marta ehm, è che ehm, le strutture in questo momento ehm, istituzionali e culturali ehm, si fanno a una burocrazia ad un tempo e ad uno spazio che mantiene dei rapporti di forza disuguali perché ehm, io mi sono stupita il primo giorno che eh, ci fossero da, da quello che mi aspettavo poche persone afrodiscendenti a questa scuola e mi sono stupita perché penso sia uno dei pochi momenti di dialogo simile ma poi mi sono risposta che non tutte le persone si possono permettere di fare una settimana una settimana così io stessa maggio inoltre però appunto ci sono delle questioni proprio di posizionamento stretto economico che le attuali strutture pur facendo un voto metaforico non, non colma cioè per me se lo, lo, lo spazio museale ha ancora senso ma non, non so se cioè per me lo spazio culturale ha senso però in una mh, decostruzione radicale per effettivamente rispecchiare la, la, la cultura contemporanea che non, mh, anche per progetti più territoriali, eh, facevo l'esempio giorni fa dei progetti culturali ibridi, eh, pure con tutte persone appunto senza background migratorio, però sono insostenibili, spesso non riescono ad essere raccontate o ad inserirsi davvero nel tempo in un contesto culturale perché eh, i, i tempi, le istituzioni, la burocrazia esercitano quel rapporto di forza che non, ehm, che non lascia spazio a, quel, a quella condivisione nel generare nuovi saperi e, e quindi mi, cioè, mi, mi ripongo la questione abbiamo bisogno di uno spazio vuoto mm, boh forse sì grazie grazie mille da un there's a writer uh, for the New York Times called Howard Coulter and he says Museums are cultural deep freezers. And I think he's got that in. And if you think about what the brother said about African sculpture, and you find that you bring it out of its environment and you put it in a, in a case, then you absolutely dismiss everything that it was about to be and was. So, uh, And then, you know, you think about our museums and you think about our foundations and you think about where all the money is. And then you think about your strategy, but your strategy without no dough means nothing. You know, but there are some ways to get around that collectively. But if, if, if the suits don't want you to do it, it's not going to happen. Thank you so much. I was, I was speaking in English. Um, I have to say that I'm always very confused when we talk about museums, especially about ethnographic and colonial museums, but also when we talk about contemporary art museums, who actually share the same genealogy of ethnographic museums. So there is always, uh, for example, a uh, contemporary art washing that comes into place, especially in Italy in the last, in the last you know, five years. There is an attempt to decolonize the colonial museum through contemporary art right now, which I think is criminal, like uh, from the very basis. Um, but I want to say that 
I think there is always a big elephant in the room when we talk about museums, which is why the Nancy has been named by Magda, because we are uh, always ready to recognize that museums, every kind of museum, have a sort of uh, colonial uh, imperial genealogy, because the very essence of this play is about that, is to create a national narrative exhibiting, you know, tokens that are not belonging to your national identity. In Italy, national identity is white. It has been whitewashed heavily for a lot of years. Um, a museum have participated heavily to this whitewash, not just uh, through whitewash of external enemies, but also of internal enemies. We do have at um, the you Lombroso know, Museum, for example, in Italy, which is still there uh, in Torino, and it's actually um, important for me that it stays there in a way. And this is what I wanted to say. That for me, all you talked about is pure uh, post-museum rhetorics, because um, it's actually a way of covering white fragility by saying, uh, museum is the house of whiteness. This is what I understand. Um, so why empty this house? If it talks about something that we never talk about, which is whiteness, how we have been constructed. And I have to say that for me, Museums are actually a house of violence, epistemic violence, but also physical violence. And in some way, uh, they have to stay there. But the position that we need to ask these museums is to talk about this, uh, what they embody in a way. Because we've, we've been going through the you know, gender turn, we've been going through the queer turn, now we're going to the racial turn. And so, Museums are opening up spaces, which is another dynamic, which is, for me, criminal. I say criminal because I am really uh, skeptical about this innocence posture museum keep, you know. keep. <laughs> That's a space of neutrality. Yeah, come here, come here. Uh, we are here for you, we make space for you, and that is super violent, especially emotionally. So, museums are about property. Museums are about creation of difference. Museums are about violence, so they have to work on that. And I remember having this discussion with uh, Magda years ago, but also with another friend of ours, which is Alessandro Ferrini, uh, what it means to open up, for example, colonial collections to Afro descendants, especially in Italy, because it means creating a heavy emotional burden as well. So maybe we need to take care of that, but at the same time, opening the space. Because, for example, the Colonial Museum of Rome, which is now called Mushi, the Museum of Cultures, changed the directorship. Still, white faggots in it, direct in it. So, I mean, there is also, because we went through the queer turn, and now we know that we have to open up to this kind, you know, but it's, it's reinforcing, uh, I don't know, have to, as I said, I'm very confused about that, but, for me, emptying the museum is reinforcing whiteness in a way, because you said, Marina, we do hide, uh, we do hide uh, because we have to show, but I think that we show because we have to hide. And actually, museums are basically oh. doing that, showing in order to hide. Hide what? Uh, the very origin of this institution, I mean, I know Justin did a huge uh, work, for example, in Uffizi, you go through fits, you see a lot of black presences, but why these people are there? Uh, I mean, because the museum needs them. Just going back maybe to Germany inside. So again, super confused, but I think the museum has to stay there in a way, because they embody something that we need to reflect on, especially in Italy. I, I agree. Agree. Thank you so much. Actually, um, it sort of leads me to the next set or, or line of questions which is, before I get to that actually, maybe we reflect collectively what it means to gaze in a two way, in a two directional way. So what does it mean to be gazed at? And what does it mean when you are doing the gazing? And again, just the same way we just did, reflecting on what that invokes. And as I did, I guess it will sort of um, generate conversation as well. So really focusing on the word, on the verb, on the action, 
of gazing and to be gazed at. And in relation, just because I know I'm definitely going to forget <laughs> to what Simone was saying, um, I think also if we're not emptying the space, if the these spaces remain, I wonder also why no one has asked what is it that I want to see as a point of reference? What is it that I'm interested to see? How is this spirit going to contribute to my being and empower me and inspire me? Um, when we think about work of art, especially spirits that have been displaced out of context, so works of art, um, how are these works going to inspire me? Removing the assumption of how I think they're going to contribute to my consciousness. But again, let's just go back to gazing. <laughs> Say the word oh, non dico in italiano. Gazing è sguardo, giusto? Sguardo, la parola sguardo. Um, just in instinct, like what does it invoke? The gaze. Yeah. Oh, puoi scegliere di riflettere sullo sguardo o cosa vuol dire essere guardati? You choose, it's a free world, allegedly. Uh, parlo in italiano. Yeah. E essere guardati. Uh, vabbè, ovviamente c'è la parte del giudizio, uh, c'è la parte del performare e c'è la parte della responsabilità, uh, sia come Uh, oggetto dello cioè, soggetto dello sguardo e, e cosa rappresenti nel, nell'essere guardato e, sì questo mi viene in mente grazie and just as a Um, caveat, the reason I'm also asking this is specifically in relation to muted artifacts or spirits because they're living things, the living beings. So as living beings ourselves, it's easier to relate if we think start shifting our understanding of these um, objects <laughs> as vessels of actual spirits and I think it's easy to relate. Um, so really it's in relation to, to that. So if you want to look. And also, I've also wanted to emphasize that an artifact taken from a spiritual or site of a sacred site and an artifact that was commissioned replicating that object, it still transcends. You know, spirits move from one vessel to another. So it's just as criminal. <laughs> just saying, there is no actual distinction between when we think about provenance. So, oh wait, this was actually taken from this sacred site or this was bought at the market because when you're sort of replicating likeness it's still the same thing um, I don't know how to eloquently should I say it? I'm gonna say it again in English I'm saying that an object that has been replicated so say a mask 
that was taken from a sacred site, but then that same mask in its likeness that was then replicated for commercial use and then bought at the market and exported away is still a sacred mask, regardless of how and the context it was produced in. Because what you're doing essentially is a multitude of spirit, <laughs> you know, like you're just recreating it and then just sort of jumping to each other. That's all. That was just a little asterisk that I just wanted to emphasize. But again, what does it mean to gaze and to be gazed at? But you're talking about objects which have been reproduced and replicated for the Western market or for yes, the Western market? Yes, exactly that. For the Western market? Yes. Where the West. It's happy. I'll talk about rainbows afterwards. Posso? Posso? Non c'entra niente, però c'entra molto. Ok. Um, oggi, non qui, da un'altra parte, um, c'è un convegno sul colonialismo. Si intitola Italiani e brava gente. E non penso che abbiano avuto eh, l'accortezza di discutere il loro posizionamento prima di fare gli inviti, perché il panel, a parte una persona che è la storica che ha curato, curato eh, la, sala, la sala, la permanente qua, che è Simona Bere, sono tutte persone eh, bianche italiane, eh, da tempo in memo anche tutte. Uh, sicché uh, cioè io capisco quello che dice Simone però uh, fare spazio fare spazio tra l'altro non è solamente c'è cioè, cioè una cosa materiale è una cosa simbolica no? cioè, ci hanno insegnato uh, Robert Dudu ci hanno detto ci sono delle cose che ci sono e non si vedono no? uh, e le cose che ci sono e non si vedono è il fatto, per esempio, o che magari si vedono anche, insomma, perché anche Germain ne ha contato di su questa cosa, è il fatto che un po' eh, quando non ci sono persone eh, direttamente coinvolte, che hanno esperienze incarnate all'interno delle strutture, certe scelte che per noi sono delle banalità, cioè delle cose che per noi sono, cioè, proprio l'ABC, cioè non passano, no? Abbiamo visto il documentario l'altro giorno, ma in Bravia Zoo, e noi subito abbiamo identificato che c'era un problema nel documentario. Eh, e in dieci anni di proiezioni questo documentario non era stato mai no, eh, messo in discussione, perché non era mai stato visto con degli occhi non bianchi. Allora, cioè, io mi chiedo, eh, va bene, teniamo, teniamo, teniamo le cose, riveliamo questa bianchezza accecante, no? Ma chi rivela cosa? Chi? Eh, non c'è no, il rischio che poi di fatto non ci siano gli strumenti per una reale messa in discussione di quella cosa lì. E poi non facciamo finta che non ci siano delle, de, cioè, delle questioni di risorse, cioè delle questioni materiali no, sotto. Ecco, la, questa ridistribuzione materiale è prevista? No? Se, non, se non è prevista, io eh, ho bisogno... No, che, che la bianchezza eh, si faccia autocritica, no? perché un po' noi adesso abbiamo questa attitudine che vabbè io ho un problema, lo dico a posto così, no? È una cosa che, beh, sono cosciente che no, sei cosciente va bene, no? Ma, ma poi, per cui cioè, quando io penso a gesti come la restituzione, restituzione alle comunità, come gli aborigini che seppelliscono gli strumenti, come... No, eh, come lo smantellamento, no? penso che eh, il passo successivo alla consapevolezza è farci qualcosa. No? E allora farci qualcosa vuol dire accompagnarsi a una morte dignitosa. Io la dignità la voglio lasciare, no? però anche non basta ammettere una cosa, bisogna anche farla finire poi a un certo punto, in qualche modo. Credo. Grazie. I think, I think what Magda was just saying in terms of it's one thing to be conscious and it's one thing to act on it is the reason why I want us to reflect 
that maybe there is a dissonance in how we understand words. <laughs> so if you don't understand something, perhaps that's what's keeping you from acting on it. And that's what I want us to invite doing, maybe, I don't know, exactly what we need to do. Like things that we find like, well, how is this even a thing? But it's because we understand it, right? And then perhaps there are instances that are not understood or that are not wanted to be understood because it's uncomfortable and it's pointed and it's work, right? It is work. And it's not work that it's, Okay, la abbiamo fatto per una settimana by. <laughs> it's work that's durational. It doesn't stop. There is no coming out of it. Like there is no coming out of it. It's work that until in your staff there are people that understand new ones, it will not stop. <laughs> like uh, we will be here next year and the year after that forever like you know because and that's why when when i spoke about i think what i think this conversation is going to do is collectively thinking archiving a toolkit i guess <laughs> we've been recorded um is that perhaps that's what's missing the tools right because because you lack that new ones, you have to align yourself with communities that have that new ones. But our, um, that alignment is a temporary alignment. It's an alignment that lasts for the duration of the project. And then bye. <laughs> you know, and then, oh wait, actually we need to again come back. <laughs> and then bye. You know. But then, if I'm not here, inside here, actually deciding, okay, that junior asked for oh, amazing September, this is what the exhibition is going to be about. And then before that, actual research in terms of this is what I think might be interesting in showcasing if we're really operating in this exercise of exhibiting and showing and caring for. I feel like with that added context, and also not just because I'm black, it means that I know what people might be interested in. Context, nuance, expertise, coherence. What is the coherence here? Um, alignment, alignment is can be fragile as well if it's not truly implemented. I like to think about like links, you know. Um, what materials is that child? Uh, what is that? Uh, 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 thank you, because I completely had a language blocking all the languages I know. But, you know, as sturdy as a child, <laughs> you know, and yeah, I feel like what's been happening in the cultural heritage sector, not just in Italy, um, is sort of alignments that can be swept through a very, very minuscule wind, you know, as, and it happens with what Simone was saying, sort of thinking about showing and showcasing work through themes. So I was told, wait, what? Like sometime last week, I was invited to talk. Oh, su questioni sulla nerezza. I was like, what? <laughs> but what is the coherence here? You know, and who and why and where? Like, why is it to be gazed on? I came back. <laughs> why would I want to be gazed on through the looking glass? Why would anyone want that? How would you feel if you were gazed on? Um, no. What space are you creating and catering for me to feel like I don't have to crouch, but I can slouch? You know? Um, 
lo sguardo è potente, <ride> you know? lo sguardo definisce. Um, gazing, gazing can be an ellipsis, it doesn't have to be a period, you know. Um, so yeah, that's why I really wanted, I, I don't know why I went on that right. Kelly, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is this. I'm still thinking through this. Thank you. Um, something that I'm quite interested in are these residencies for artists, quite often housed in the education department of museums, which essentially put them in a fishbowl for people to look at. Um, so I know there's one in Aarhus, in the Contemporary Art Museum in Denmark. Um, if you go to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the ceramics residency is yeah. in the ceramics wing. Like this is a thing that is happening. And people um, that, and also museums uh, and educational institutions have been building windows into workspaces. Um, and I've been seeing this like in, in many places. And it's like this conflation between like seeing and understanding and this conflation between like understanding and valuing and then this conflation between valuing and money and then money and support. And then there are these artists there, right? And they're like expected to perform. They're on show. They're to be gazed at. They're expected to perform. And they're not expected to perform what art actually looks like, which is right like this. Um, um, or like on your computer, or just like thinking and looking at like something for a while. Like they're supposed to be looking like they're making art, you know? And so I've talked to some people who have done these residencies and they have to choose what they're going to make to make sure that it's going to be visually engaging for an audience. And that, right, I think is just so confusing and stupid. But anyway, so... <laughs> Um, so there's something in that, I think. And then I had a separate thought when um, when Dudu spoke about, like, you know, these are objects are not art. It's kind of this moment of like, <gasps> you know, <laughs> but like, is that because we associate art with value? Like, and what is the museum's role in terms of telling us what objects we should value? Um, and how like, yeah, there are a lot of things that we value that aren't art. So why do objects need to be art? Um, like that it, it doesn't, they don't. Um, so to be a value, they don't need to be art of value to be a value. And so, um, yeah, I think there, yeah, I think I was just thinking around like museums as telling us what to value and then the importance of one, one of the people that spoke in the past couple of days like showed us this picture of, of, a, of a, you know, like what if you were a child and you went to this museum and you saw this like, you know, face and this sculpture, how would you feel? Um, and it's like, you can see these faces on the internet now, you know, um, or in a community if you're lucky enough to have one to be reflected, I mean, if not in your family. Um, if you're, if you're lucky. Um, but it's like, what does it mean to see your face in a museum alongside all of these other faces that have been valued in this way that you, uh, you, you know they matter. And so because your face is alongside their faces, you also must matter. Um, and so what does it mean to devalue art and to devalue artists? And to devalue these, that to devalue museums that tell us what is of value, um, and how does that destabilize? Like it's like a fight or flight mode, you know. You're like, oh no, I have to have value because if I don't have value, then I can't get a job and I can't get money and I can't take care of my family. It's like there's very something. I feel like there's very some, there's like something very basic about like, oh, but I need value, I need to be valued, my work needs to be valued. Um, but like, what would happen if we let go of that, if we're, if we are privileged enough to be able to let go of that? Um, and like how that could make things possible, like 
yeah, right, like art doesn't matter to a, like, a lot of people and they're living great lives, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with the critique, and I always do. And but but again, I think I I stopped listening. Uh, I look, stopped listening to that to the, the to white discourse as the only discourse that's valued. And so you know, sometimes listening to the people who are making work in the '60s um, cues us to reevaluating a completely different set of things. The gallery and the museum is not the only place to make your work. You really don't have to see yourself in the Art Institute. You can make the Studio Museum in Harlem. I'm writing a book right now with Thelma on the Studio Museum in Harlem. And, you know, I guess I just want us to ask about what does it mean to produce black institutions? I just made an exhibition on black space. There can be black space. We can produce it. We can do it through alternate economies. If somebody says, no, we can't, if they could do it in 1967 when they had less dough, as yeah. Robert says, um, less connectivity, less education, no PhDs, no art degrees, no art school, no parents, some of them who are bankers, no connectivity to people with access, no conversations with people who have the agency to, to give space for a moment. So I guess I just I just want to say that that there should be multiple strategies and one of those strategies should be actively to produce uh, something in the face of all of this, uh, you know, of all, at the same time as there's is the critique. Thank you so much. And I think just this it might be just right, the right person to follow up with that. Thank you for I wanted to follow up on uh, Romy York on this, but also on uh, what Kelly was saying in regards to the valuing, because um, one thing that I'm, I'm a bit of a broken record when it comes to this one sort of reflection, because as, as an artist who is um, uh, involved in many different cultural practices um, and who has been a teacher for many years, a lot of people ask, what is an artist? And that tends to be a really difficult question to answer. If you really understand something profound about art. And, um, but the closest thing to an answer to that that I've come up with, and it's one that I use as for myself and the people around me, is that artists are the people that recalibrate value. That's it. They recalibrate social value, they recalibrate cultural value, but they also recalibrate economic value. So it's, it's destabilizing because it shows that none of that stuff is actually said. And I think that's really important also in terms of thinking about um, sort of los guardo looking. Um, I think there's lots of, I, I wrote some notes because there's, it's a complicated one that's really important to think about um, because it's about perspective. Um, and I think so often we're, um, it's, it's really uh, easy, um, I think, um, based on the sort of social mechanisms that are around us based on the forms of education that we engage in to remain with fairly singular points of perspective um, that don't have the complexities of the, even the world we walk around in every single day. Um, and I think that in order to sort of break out of that, we have to think about a lot of things in terms of looking. And so the first is that in looking, of course, in thinking about the way that we see things, there's all these different dimensions to that. Um, when we're, I think, I have, a, I have a little bit of difficulty sometimes between looking and gazing, right? Because maybe the gaze is about uh, reflexive looking or something of this sort. But I think that um, when we're looking, there is this sort of reasoning or reflection that happens around it. And it involves our, our, our beings as individuals and as absolute individuals, but it also involves these forms of collectivity. Um, these collective knowledges, these collective ways of, of perceiving things, right, that are embedded in us. Um, but then I think that we are very aware of the social constraints that are around us at all times, that they don't have, that don't have to be said to us. It's the reason that why we go into a museum, we kind of, I don't know about you, I have my hands behind my back most of the time, you know, just to be unassuming, right? Um, I keep my voice down, you know, because I've been trained socially that this is what you do in these spaces that it's inappropriate to, to speak uh to to move right that's why it's so uh, amazing when you see like a dancer in a museum because you're like 
that that's breaking social rules that have been put in place. And those social rules are there to protect very specific things. Um, and I think that, you know, um, the social constraints of looking is we move through different sites. We understand what those look, are like as well, because if you ever been on a metro in New York City, you know you better not be looking everywhere, <laughs> right? Um, but that's the same going back into, like, you know, uh, thinking about the social policing of the segregated South and reckless eyeballing. It's the same, like, there's these certain unwritten, but we know, rules to how we're supposed to be looking, and what constrains what we look at, when we look at it. And I think that those things are important to keep in mind because they form a part of it. But the last thing, and I'll, I'll, this one's more complicated, I'll try to um, open it up, because I had, I had a conversation that was very, very meaningful to me um, uh, maybe about 10 years ago um, with an artist who um, comes from the US um, named Dave McKenzie. Um, and he was here as a fellow at the American Academy in Rome. And when I started to talk about um, you know, what he was encountering on the streets, he said that he saw this poster um, uh, that was an anti-immigration poster. Okay. And this poster had a, a boat full of African people. And he said, I couldn't read the language of what it said, but I knew what it was talking about. And I knew it was about me, but I didn't see me. And I think that the poster and whoever created it didn't see me either. And so it's like this, these the layers and dimensions between seeing, even recognizing how that connects to us as individuals, as collective beings, but also thinking about what it is that it actually connects to and if that is actually ours. And I think that those things are, are the, some of the complexities in terms of looking and, and gazing, like what that actually encompasses. Um, it's, it's tough, but one thing that is very, very clear is that it's much easier to have a single point perspective if you and people that have had the same formation are in the same space all the time. All right. Thank you so much, Justin, for that beautiful offering. Um, I also, I don't know who's got the mic next, but I also want us to think about what it means to return the gaze and sustain the gaze, right? Um, I don't know what the mic is. I, I had my eyes closed. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, about the gaze and uh, this re reflection, uh, I would say about uh, all the contribution that uh, were made. Uh, that uh, if, uh, for example, if you there is an object in the museum, we can look at it. We can gaze but we can't understand it if we don't have uh, the right interpreters. So if you involve, you share the heritage with people, you can gaze. Sometimes you can say, I gaze, but I don't understand because uh, you need an interpreter. And uh, uh, when we speak about the um, making space, um, Svotare, you can uh, svotare, I don't know in English. It's okay, I, I, I speak it English every time. Uh, 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 if you uh, svotare uh, a space, uh, you, you have to svotare um, <coughs> the material object just to resignificate it with the, the sharing with the right interpreters and also how the museum can do this. Um, and the museum, I think, it can be a place to be um, gazed, but it has to gaze also. If he, he, it gazes, <laughs> it can be inclusive, it can involve communities uh, or people and uh, uh, listen to their needs. That maybe another guy said, uh, we are here and we are pri privileged because uh, sometimes people don't have uh, time. Their preoccupation is not art. It's uh, to have food on the table and 
other things. So the museum have uh, to shape itself in this way. So uh, a place uh, um, that can reflect uh, the, the gazing. So if a, if a person uh, isn't uh, uh, reflected, uh, doesn't feel reflected in the museum, it's a problem because uh, the museum is also a social institution, I think, that would uh, <laughs> have to spread the culture and to be inclusive. This is my vision. But uh, you, you can do it, as uh, you said, uh, if it won't. <laughs> there are strategies just to applicate. Maybe it's a little confused. No, no, I, thank you so much, because actually, you, you reminded me of a dream I had last night. <laughs> but I don't know, and I'm trying to understand if it was a dream or a nightmare, definitely anxiously in preparation to today. Um, but it was an empty room. And actually, I think also been, because it's a follow up of a conversation that Pat with Theo like years ago. But anyway, it was, I, I think I was <laughs> in an empty room. Um, and it was, it was, there was glass everywhere, so sort of mirrors everywhere, so. And on the ceiling and on the floor, sort of surrounded. And I believe that I was in that room, however, I didn't see myself in those reflections and that's why I'm coming back to that. Because you reminded me that I had that dream or nightmare. <laughs> Because it's actually quite scary. And I think actually it connects perfectly to the experiences of uh, seeing these collections that are supposedly about me, but I don't see me because of the way they've been collected. So thank you for that. <laughs> Yes, and the one of the How do you define that? Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of definition, but the one of the the one I like a lot of definition of that one. What is a, a part uh, between the community and the heritage, and how the community takes care of the its own heritage, and also there is a contraposition between. Uh, let's say, classical museums that are uh, visitors uh, and collections and um, building. And the Eco Museum is heritage, community and territory. So there is a contraposition. And um, also one of the father of Eco Museums, so the concept, let's say, of this, it's Riviere that said that the Eco Museums are mirrors of their communities. So to your dream, <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, school of things, uh, new museology that now it's called social museology. Um, it's a school of reflection, reflection about this, and uh, also to uh, separate uh, practices and definition. Because, for example, in Brazil and in other places. Uh, Museologia sociale, the social museology are practices. So people do things to manage their heritage and they don't care if it's a museum or they don't care about it. But uh, this uh, kind of management of the heritage, it's a reflection of their needs, basically. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if we did have time, I wanted to disconstruct what we mean or what you intend by classical museum and then the heritage, because I, I believe our centers are not aligned, but we don't have time. <laughs> but I also, I wanted to also go back on what Kelly said earlier in terms of what we place value on and what we keep and what we sort of discard. And I think that's correlated also to the practice of um, 
showing and showcasing. And I also, um, from here, <laughs> very touched by Gaia as well. And I can see that um, you are emotional. And <laughs> And that makes me that makes me happy actually because it means that we've created a bubble safe enough for you to be vulnerable. And I thank you for that. Um, but you wanted to say something. Uh, I was uh, reflecting. Uh, I'm now changing Italian because it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, su un'altra questione dello sguardo. Che eh, un altro problema che trovo ad esempio la cosa che mi ha messo a disagio nella mostra permanente è che ho visto esposto lo sguardo del double standard, cioè da una parte il non racconto della complessità storica eh, di diversi continenti, dall'altra il chiedere esplicitamente la parola a determinati gruppi di persone eh, il primo giorno uscito fuori come argomento, come tokenism, però cioè, vorrei che, la, ehm, che riattualizzassimo anche in Italia questa dinamica, perché secondo me c'entra con lo sguardo, cioè ehm, un'istituzione um, o un ente con un rapporto di potere economico, un rapporto di potere squilibrato che chiede ad artisti di um, mostrarsi ma senza collaborare su tutta la costruzione, cioè su, sulla costruzione dello sguardo della, della mostra. Cioè, c'è una dinamica molto specifica perché eh, non solo eh, viene invisibilizzato e quindi nascosta la cultura, ma viene anche chiesto il, il lavoro che, ripeto, non tutti ci possiamo permettere per causa di rapporti di forza squilibrati da secoli, eh, di dover raccontare, dover farsi capire um, all'interno di un determinato contesto. Non so se ho reso, cerco di sintetizzare meglio. Il punto è um, anche il dover sempre um, spiegare che c'è un'alternativa. Cioè, se vogliamo parlare di culture condivise e di patrimonio condiviso, allora c'è bisogno di una ricerca condivisa, perché come persone razzializzate eh, in Italia siamo, ma come penso nel mondo, siamo eh, nella posizione di dover imparare il doppio e di, ci viene chiesto di performare il doppio quando per la stessa identica carica ehm, o, o lavoro ad una persona con un eh, background solo europeo mh, viene chiesta la verità de, 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 dello sforzo, della ricerca proprio perché è, è la persona che emette lo sguardo questa cosa io la noto tanto anche a livello artistico cioè a livello artistico mh, Vedo come sia più facile per artisti con solo background europeo ehm, trattare temi assolutamente estetici. A parte che mh, personalmente trovo fondamentale l'arte intrecciata con questioni attuali, però anche lì, cioè perché è, è più frequente che una persona eh, bianca mh, possa raccontare semplicemente come vede il mondo e a una persona prodiscendente eh, se decide di raccontare il mondo per come lo vede deve spiegare tutto cioè quella cosa aumenta il rapporto di forza squilibrato nell'attualità cioè lo fa tutti i giorni e, cioè lo sguardo mi ha colpito perché si, si mh, apre in tanti modi, poi vabbè, mh, due giorni fa c'era un, um, una persona 
eh, psicoterapeuta Murphy che mh, ha parlato anche dal punto di vista psicologico quanto lo sguardo eh, della bianchezza fa perché mh, psicologicamente l'essere umano si ridefinisce nella collettività, nello sguardo reciproco però se quello sguardo è sempre in rapporto di forza disuguali eh, appunto diventa eh, tristemente <ride> e assolutamente normale come diceva Wissal che siano le persone razzalizzate poi a vivere burnout e, e niente, a, a, cioè, non solo non avere lo spazio per esprimere il proprio sguardo ma ehm, per provare a esprimere il proprio sguardo dover rispondere anche allo sguardo del resto del, degli altri interlocutori perché gli altri interlocutori non hanno il bisogno di studiare quello che sono le altre culture e per culture intendo anche eh, ricerche contemporanee cioè mh, porsi appunto la questione sul il, fare il lavoro di posizionamento da sol e mh, appunto questa cosa anche non mi pare mh, davvero insostenibile No, don't, you don't need to apologize. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, thank you, actually. Um, it just also made me think about the reason why this is structured like this. It's because I said that this whole thinking was moved by refusal and dissidence, right? I have no interest whatsoever <laughs> laboring alone. I, it's not something I'm interested in doing. Also, because I don't even have enough iron for that to sustain it. <laughs> you know, um, I think there is so much power in collectivity, in thinking together. And I often find when you are just presenting and thinking one direction and being you're being gazed on, right? And that makes me comfortable. <laughs> um, I, I think there is so much that we carry, that we're going to carry after today um, by thinking in the collective live and direct. But I also was reflecting on this idea of returning the gaze and looking at each other and understanding each other in parallel, right? I am obsessed with parallels, you know? And I think there is a very obvious question that follows up, which is a queenly. <laughs> so what do we do? Um, what does, to conclude, oh, it's exactly one o'clock, so we're gonna commit five more minutes of just imagination and that's free flow imagination to conclude we've pulled our grievances uh, we've stated what we stated but what do we what does an ideal museum the way we understand it in this context look like i can already contribute with one thing <laughs> staff your people <laughs> Start with staffing your people on your staff to be other, so you can think how we're doing right now and in a future. <laughs> you know, start from the office, first of all, pay them. <laughs> pay them. <laughs> they don't have to be in a role of assistance, but in a role that is assertive. Start from home. This is your home. Start from here. And then sort of plant your seeds, right? I think I think it really does start from home. Um, returning to this idea that I have no interest in laboring alone. I absolutely do not want to be a point of reference because I have other interests <laughs> other than this. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think start from home. Um, because that's the, you know, 
you're, you're, you're taking care of your own garden, right? And that's the way you can show off your garden as well. And um, yeah, I think I think it's it's a good point to start. Yeah. I think um, to I have a question about this about hiring. Uh, I think because this is a, a civic museum, it has some uh, uh, particular. Uh, I don't know English. I don't know English. Uh, sono delle procedures. Concorso. Right. Could you, could you please explain us? Yes. Because it's important, I think. Thank you. Because it's not like the easiest day pleasant. And also not just because they're black, they should be hired, they should actually have expertise and context and coherence. Forse lo dico in italiano perché è più utile visto che si tratta di una soluzione. Um, allora, intanto possiamo solo assumere cittadini europei. E, e le assunzioni avvengono per concorso e, e fare un concorso non è una cosa che decidiamo noi ma è una cosa che viene decisa dal, da un dipartimento che si chiama risorse umane che in base al budget dell'intero comune decide quante assunzioni vengono fatte e lo discute con il sindacato e I musei civici di Milano sono uh, sotto uh, understaffed, sotto... Non c'è personale. Non c'è personale. Non c'è personale. <ride> personale. Ecco, uh, banalmente un museo come questo dovrebbe avere uh, un conservatore per ogni continente, che sarebbe il minimo veramente sindacale, ma no? in realtà non è così, perché abbiamo un Uh, L'unica possibilità che abbiamo di fare contratti è quella di fare dei contratti temporanei di collaborazione e, e allora ovviamente sono delle, delle, non sono assunzioni, sono cose temporanee che tu fai su progetti e quindi lo abbiamo fatto per il comitato scientifico, quindi la prima cosa che abbiamo fatto quando, quando sono tornata io qui è stato quello di diversificare, cioè di creare un comitato scientifico che non c'era che secondo me è fondamentale perché tu hai bisogno di un board di riferimento no? e, e di diversificare, quindi, ma poi ne parleremo dopo pranzo, il museo adesso non voglio uccidere. Eh, e poi abbiamo fatto un concorso per un curatore, poi vi spiegherò dopo la visione perché io non sono così convinta che sia solo una questione um, di, di colore della pelle, ma penso anche che sia una questione di social rank, di storia, di vissuto e di competenze, cioè sia più complicato di così. Per cui sono convintissima che c'è assolutamente bisogno dello sguardo razzializzato, ma non solo. Insomma, comunque ne parleremo dopo, perché è un discorso che non si fa all'una e ci... Però sono in uscita due concorsi. <ride> in ambito culturale dovrebbero essere per istruttore culturale e per bibliotecario nell'ambito culturale grazie actually I, I know I promised that we will leave with a less heavy heart I promise rainbows but I have no rainbows to offer so Kelly you, you had a lot of rainbows yesterday yeah if you have um, I'm Humbly asking for you to share something that will make us leave with a lighter heart. Thank you. That's intense. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can share a joke or something or a reflection. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I think. Um, ah, could you pull a card for us, maybe? Yes. Could you pull a card? For yes. Do you not have the cards with you? Kevin, that is a beautiful idea. You do have them? You don't have them. Oh. I, I, you oh, have the cards. Well, I liked the card that maybe Magda. Do you do you wanna do you yes. like your card? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I, I have to read my card. <laughs> yes, thank thank you. So my card is in my mm, phone um, uh, I don't know what to say. Okay. Okay. Uh, repeat this every morning. Look, can I read it in, in Italian? Certo. Okay. Ripeti questo ogni mattina. Sei un idiota adesso. Sei stato un idiota in passato e sarai un idiota in futuro. Non ci sono molte altre possibilità per un essere umano. <ride> Every morning.
morning, you're an Egypt now. You have been an Egypt in the past, and you would be an Egypt again. There aren't any other available options for a human being. Thank so, you so, so much. So mine, huh? no, but also thank no. you. <laughs> thank you very much, Ms. Zura. It has been a very productive morning. We will see each other here at 2:50, at 2 50, 50, from 2:50 to 3:30. Okay. Uh, and we will discuss about possible takeaway uh, and other issues uh, related to the museum. Coherence, I love that. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> have a nice lunch.